Good afternoon, colleagues. And good morning to colleagues who are joining us this morning from Toronto. A very warm welcome to everybody from a very nippy and cold Johannesburg quite late in the afternoon. Uh, my name is Prisha Ramsaru, and I'm the director of the Center for Researching Education and Labor. We're gonna to start today with me just giving you a short introduction to the center. And then I will hand over to my colleagues, Palesa and uh, Stephanie, who will come on later today. So Real is a postgraduate research center in the Witt School of Education. Uh, the Real Center, as you'd see from our, the picture of some of our students, is a vibrant, diverse community of scholars the center is quite an extraordinary hub within the School of Education at WITS. It has uh, researchers from, from broad range of backgrounds, actively engaged in research, uh, as well as having a very active postgraduate programs with uh, uh, active masters, as well as a, a vast number of PhD students. The center is involved in research in four main research focus areas uh, displayed as, as you can see displayed on the screen. One of the first focal areas that we're looking at at the moment is skills and skills ecosystems for a just transition in times of increasing equality. And we have a range of research projects as well as research working with issues around this. The second focus area, research focus area for us is development, skill formation systems and the changing world of work. Our third focus area is occupations, qualifications, knowledge, skills and the world of work. The, the fourth focus area of the center is post-school institutions and the provision of vocational education and training in both formal and informal contexts, which of course is extremely relevant within Africa. So the center's work is broadly focused in trying to research this relationship between education and work. And that is why we are so excited today to kickstart our education and work seminar series. And we are so excited and that Lisa was able to join us today to kickstart our series. So Lisa uh, Wheelahan will be kickstarting this education and work series. And on the screen, what you will see are some of the, the, the seminars that we have planned for the next six months of the year. On the 14th of April, Professor Hugh Lauder from the University of Bath will be joining us to examine the death of human capital. In May, on the 5th of May, uh, Professor Ken Spurs from University College London and the work that he's doing with skills ecosystems models and how he's looking at the evolution of skills ecosystems models to look at social, what he's calling social skills ecosystems. And we're, we're looking forward to that. And then the next seminar is gonna bring us back home to share some of the, the important research that's happening from within the center and Professor Alais will be sharing some of the work that she has been doing around understanding, educating for work in the time of COVID and how this work was linked to the national skills strategy post for the post COVID renewal, skills renewal plan. So Steph will share some of that work in that seminar. In, the, in June, what we'd like to share is that Part of our program, we were very proud. We had four PhDs awarded during 2020, and we're gonna have a PhD panel with these four PhD uh, graduates who will be sharing their, their PhD studies and, and an insight into the type of research that's ongoing within, within Rio. Our next June seminar is uh, Leslie Powell, She's from the University of the Western Cape and a, a strong colleague of ours within South Africa and a very active uh, researcher within the vocational education space in Africa. And Leslie will also be talking about COVID-19 and the national skills planning processes within South Africa. And then on the 14th of July, 
we uh, uh, have, are just confirming with the Professor John Buchanan, who will be looking at enabling renewal, focusing on education, better citizenship, occupations and labor markets. So we're hoping and we're ex very excited about this education and work seminar series. And we're hoping that many of you are gonna be joining us through the, uh, through the rest of the year. We're putting together the seminar program for the next six months of the year. But it's important to get to today. And for that, I'd like to hand you over to Palesa Malobatsi. Palesa is a PhD scholar at Real. She's almost at the end. We hope this uh, seminar is, she's hoping to hand in in April. So I hope this is going to give her the final impetus to cross that finish line. And she is the seminar coordinator at Real. She will introduce us to our, to our speaker for this afternoon. After Lisa finishes with her presentation for today, my colleague Stephanie Ale will be managing the discussion this afternoon. So from me and from everyone at Real, a very warm welcome. A huge welcome to, to, to the center and to our seminar program for 2021. And we look forward to seeing you throughout the year. So over to you, Palesa. Thank you so much, Prisha. And I must say, I'm very, very excited to be the official seminar coordinator, given that the lineup is obviously incredibly exciting. So I feel very privileged to be playing that role. Um, okay, so today I have the pleasure of introducing Professor uh, Lisa Wheelahan, who is the William G. Davis Chair in Community College Leadership. She's based in the Department of Leadership, Higher and Adult Education in the Ont Ontario Institute for Studies in education at the University of Toronto. So her research interests are quite wide. They include the role of knowledge in vocational qualifications, the links between tertiary education and labor markets, social justice and student equity, professional development of teachers in vocational education and training, qualifications frameworks, and credit pathways in tertiary education. So she has researched and published widely in these topics. And I will now hand over to Professor Wheelahan. We're all quite eager to hear her paper this afternoon, which is titled Gig Qualifications for the Gig Economy, Micro-Credentials and the Hungry Mile. So welcome, Professor Wheelahan. Thank you, Palesa. I will first um, get my screen up. Uh, can, what can you see? Your slides. Can you see? Oh, but it's, see. it's not on present of you, Lisa. Oh, okay. Right. All right. Slideshow. Slide show. Okay. Is it on present of you now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off by uh, thanking... Uh, is it on the first page? Yes, it is. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to start off by thanking Steph for this opportunity um, to present on our work today. It's always a pleasure um, to work with, with her and the uh, Researching Education and Labor Center at the University of Wits. This has been a very long standing collaboration, um, and there are many, many things that um, we have in common. Um, so I'm presenting on behalf of my uh, co-author, Gavin Moody, uh, who is also uh, with us today. And I'm presenting on a paper that we've submitted to a journal and we're just waiting to see, go through the vicissitudes of the reviewing process. So we're not quite sure exactly um, what's happening with that just yet. Um, I, I also want to acknowledge that we are both Australians, but also now also Canadians who are working at the University of Toronto. And we are drawing from research that we've done in both countries over many years. Before I uh, commence the actual seminar, I want to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat people, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And this is where we work and where we have um, where we, from which we are presenting um, to today. Right. Oops. 
So micro-credentials are, uh, have been presented as the new big thing which will solve the problems of education in the labour market, promote social inclusion, self-realisation, personalisation, student-centred learning, and so on. The hype about micro-credentials um, claims that they are the, the, the new big thing that will, it is argued, revolutionise higher education. And this is similar to the hype about MOOCs that we had almost um, 10 years ago. Well, in thinking about this, we started our paper um, by referring to the Hungry Mile. And the Hungry Mile refers to the lines of unemployed men who walked along the wharves in Sydney during the Great Depression, um, hoping to be picked for a, a day's work. And they often lived within a mile or so of the docks um, so they could get there quickly and be available for any work that, uh, that was available and for which they were selected. Their wives and kids lived in poverty and women had to try and make everything work and to stretch um, the below average wage further while their husbands had to be available at any time for as long as the boss wanted. And, and this, this stanza here is from a, it's the first stanza of a poem by Ernest Antony in a, in a poem called The Hungry Mile, written in 1930, where he says, they tramp there in their legions on the mornings dark and cold to beg the rights to slave for bread from Sydney's lords of gold. They toil and sweat in slavery, twould make the devil smile to see the Sydney wharfies tramping down the hungry mile. We also talk about the bull system, and the bull system is the system that was used to um, allocate work on the docks. And Winfred uh, Mitchell, writing in um, 19, 1977, explains that this system was called the bull system because based on dehumanising principle. She says that the heaviest cargoes were handled by the biggest and strongest labourers. These men were known as bulls. And since they were preferred by the employing agents to men of average strength, they were usually sure of a job. Um, Stevens, who works for the uh, Australian Museum, she says that foremen picked only the strongest and least troublesome men to hire for the day. She says scenes of chaos and desperation were common as foremen casually tossed job tickets into the air to be snatched up by the quickest men. Those who succeeded in gaining a day's work were then exposed to dangerous and backbreaking working conditions. The gig economy takes a different form today, but it is still underpinned by the same ruthless logic and brutality as the ball system. And we argue that the gig economy has enlisted higher education in its service. The emergence of micro-credentials is the latest change to higher education to serve employees' interests more closely and to putatively promote social inclusion, self-realisation, personalisation and student-centred learning. I can't emphasise enough how this discourse of progressivism under, uh, uh, imbues the whole move to micro-credentials. And while um, definitions of micro-credentials aren't fully settled, there's an emerging consensus that they are short courses aligned with industry, which are substantive enough um, to be counted towards a full qualification. And in turn, micro-credentials um, may consist of smaller units of learning, such as badges, digital badges, or digital certificates. And I go into this a bit more later. However, Rather than being vehicles for social inclusion and access to good jobs, we argue that micro-credentials are gig credentials for the gig economy. And what they facilitate is, um, or are underpinned by is the, the, that individuals have to take on risk themselves to second guess the requirements of the labor market so that they have the right skills needed for the right job. They represent the outsourcing and cost shifting of employers' internal professional development programs to individuals who must take um, on the cost of doing these programs and demonstrate that they are market ready. They also represent the deeper incursion of the language of employability and competency-based training to higher education, and they feed the myth perpetuated by human capital theory that the right credential will result in a good job and break through social congestion in the labour market or just get you a foot in the door. So in this presentation, we've got three main sections. The first section, which is the, the biggest, um, is on micro-credentials and higher education. And we're going to look at what they are, 
how they've been um, included in um, policy frameworks, um, how, how competency-based training has uh, underpins them, the difference between micro-credentials and, and what's gone before, um, how they discipline universities and facilitate privatisation and marketization, even of public institutions. The second, um, the second section that we're going to talk about is the tension between accreditation, lifelong learning policies that want to accredit everything, get everything included um, and counted, and the tension with just-in-time skills. In this, we are drawing on work um, by Hugh Lauder, which he's going to be talking about, um, and others, um, to, to look at the family squabble between human capital theory and skills bias technological change. And then the final section is micro-credentials as a response to, pre to precariousness in the labour market. That's precariousness for all of us and not just those who are trying to hustle to make a living in the gig economy. So just to get into the first section, there's been an enormous amount of policy attention given to um, micro-credentials. The big think tanks and philanthropic trusts like the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Lumina Foundation are investing enormous amounts of money in getting them embedded in policy frameworks in different jurisdictions, particularly in the United States, um, in, uh, in many college and university jurisdictions. New Zealand has included, was the first to do this, micro-credentials into their qualifications framework. Australia has introduced a new um, uh, higher education certificate, which I'll go into a bit more later. The Ontario government in Canada has special funding for institutions and students for micro-credentials. And in the US, uh, many states are implementing them as um, core to their teacher development programs. And governments have used the COVID crisis to really drive the implementation of change into, um, uh, into their policy frameworks um, as they've tried to, to respond to massive increases in unemployment. And as universities have tried to compensate for cash for um, international enrolments, for example, in Australia, where the international student um, enrolment has been completely decimated, um, uh, universities have used uh, micro-credentials as a way to make up partly for some of that um, shortfall. The Australian government, which always believes that you should never let a good crisis go to waste, um, has said that micro-credentials are here to stay. So what they are is that they are alternative credentials which are substantive enough to count towards a full qualification, usually about six months. Um, certainly that's what the Australian Higher Education Certificate is. And they can be made up of many smaller components, you know, digital badges, micro um, courses and micro certifications. So the idea is you build from the bottom up um, so that the, the, the um, total is the sum of the parts. What they do is they further shape higher education as a microeconomic tool to serve the economy and market society. And they do this in, um, they help to achieve two goals. First is to discipline curriculum so it is more focused on work. They, they micro-credentials are by definition aligned with industry. Um, and the second is to discipline universities so they're more market responsive um, and market oriented. Um, for example, the uh, then Australian Government Minister for Education, Dan Tan, explained in a, in a speech that in 2020, the development of micro-credentials will drive innovation and provide an additional income stream for universities while making them more efficient, relevant to industry and responsive to the requirements of domestic students. So micro-credentials are mostly self-paced and online, but they can actually be in any mode, including face-to-face um, -face learning. And they have been facilitated by um, digital platforms. They were first used by, by MOOCs. And the idea of them is that they'll capture all learning, even micro units of, of learning. For example, I've read stuff where um, there's micro credentials of 20 minutes for things like empathy, learning empathy, interpersonal skills and design thinking. Um, and the idea is that um, 
they will offer uh, new credentialing methods and systems, and as Kiwi uh, argues, um, that can capture, recognise and validate a broader range of learning outcomes in the era of lifelong learning. So the rationale for micro credentials is, as we've seen for many reforms, such as competency-based training that actually, you know, which have used the language of progressivism, um, but actually serve the interests of um, uh, marketization and privatization of higher education. The aims are democracy, social inclusion, self-realization. All of these things are accessed through private for-profit entities like YouTube and the, the Khan Academy. Um, private for-profit entities which have been able to um, use university curriculum in, in implementing um, these micro-credentials through um, profit-making enterprises. So the argument for micro-credentials continues that individuals are free to choose what they will learn, how, when, and in what ways. They will putatively provide um, disadvantaged students with access to cheaper learning as they build towards a full credential uh, and in that way contribute to widening access to hitherto excluded groups. They can respond to the changing needs of the workplace, it is said, by allowing individuals to upskill when and how they need to, and it is claimed probably for lower cost. Um, and indeed, the language of empowerment, self-regulated learning and learner autonomy, personalization, intrinsic self-motivation and self-realization are associated with micro-credentials in the same way as they're associated with MOOCs. So the rationale for micro-credentials is that um, they will ensure that people have the skills that they need to start work tomorrow. That um, the phrase we use in Australia for this is shovel ready, that you know, you're ready to go out and start digging the ground. Um, and that they will allow people to update as, as they need to. Um, they, will, they are said to allow the personalising and the recognising of professional learning, particularly, for example, the professional learning that many of the professions are required to undertake and that they can respond to the changing needs of the workplace by allowing individuals to upskill when and how they need to. Um, so the emphasis is on market relevance, job ready, bite-sized chunks that can be stackable towards a full qualification. And Curtin University in Western Australia has just announced a suite of credentials that they say will support learners who seek to continue their professional development, training and industry focused study in shorter formats, delivering just in time learning tailored to their professional needs or lifestyle. And these just in time units can be stacked into a professional graduate, into a graduate certificate of professional practice, which is a, 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 a recognized credential on the Australian qualifications framework. So basically, we think that um, micro-credentials are facilitating the incursion of competency-based training into higher education, despite the horror many in higher education have traditionally had competency-based training, usually because it was associated with vocational education and vocational education is not higher education. Um, so micro-credentials are usually based on competencies. Um, they come from vocational education where it is the dominant model of curriculum in many countries. It takes the language of um, learning outcomes, employability skills, graduate attributes and 21st century skills that one step further. Micro-credentials are based on a tighter model of, com of competencies which are linked to skills required of work. Now we did, many of us including Steph, including us have been saying for many years, you know, that that um, this model of curriculum in higher education will eventually have a big impact on universities, and so it has. And Deng, Deng, um, Zongyi Deng, Deng explains that um, competency-based models of curriculum did not originate in education as curricular concepts, but rather as managerial concepts that originate from the field of human resource uh, management. And the explicit purpose of competency-based curriculum is to tie education directly to workplace requirements and roles and micro-credentials are the vehicle through which this is occurring. I want to, for a moment, um, distinguish between micro-credentials and continuing education that universities have traditionally um, offer, offered. And they differ in two ways. First, in their curricular focus and second, in the language of accreditation. So 
university um, university continuing ed education departments have traditionally offered a broad range of programs that may or may not have labour market relevance. For example, languages, creative writing, music, philosophy, humanities, um, as well as those programs that did have a more professional development focus. In contrast, micro-credentials are more explicitly focused on labour market and the um, Eritrea New, Ze uh, New Zealand Qualifications Framework makes this explicit. Micro-credentials certify achievement of learning and outcomes and strong evidence of need by industry employers, Maori nations in New Zealand and, and community. And the second way in which micro-credentials differ from continuing education departments is through the language of accreditation, um, where uh, there's been attempts to mainstream and include micro-credentials in formally recognised qualification frameworks as the above examples have demonstrated. Continuing education is usually uncredentialed um, and their qualifications don't have the same currency in the labour market. Um, and efforts to make micro-credentials count signals the, the standing of these credentials to employers and potential students and, the, and their capacity to stack towards full qualifications. There is a big tension here, and I refer to this um, a bit later, on quick to market on the one hand and getting everything formally certified and accredited on the other. I want to look at um, for a moment how micro-credentials are able to contribute to the disciplining of universities. Um, the first is through the deficit language about universities and um, university curriculum. They have been, you know, with the traditional stories that they're slow, unresponsive, they lack motivation, they're slow to change and so on. This is not new. Um, we have heard this in vocational education for many years where vocational education institutions has, have been cast as inefficient and needing disciplining by the market because they were said to teach outdated programs that employers didn't want and students didn't need leading to skills mismatches and declines in productivity because employers couldn't get graduates with the right skills. And the solution in vocational education in countries such as Australia, the UK and South Africa was to impose competency-based training tightly in which units of learning were aligned to workplace tasks and, tasks and roles, leading to tick and flick um, of the minutely specified learning outcomes in a teacher-proof um, curriculum. So the, the, mechanism, the, the mechanism for controlling or disciplining the curriculum in higher education isn't as overt as it is um, in um, uh, vocational education and it occurs m through carrots and sticks, particularly funding. And as I said before, there's been lots of funding made available in Ontario by government to universities and colleges to implement micro-credentials, but also just more broadly um, funding as a mechanism to discipline universities. So in Australia, this is just outrageous. It is now more expensive to do, as an arts graduate I speak, um, it is now more expensive to do an arts degree than it is to do medicine, veterinary science or dentistry. Um, arts degrees putatively don't have good job outcomes and government wants to encourage students to do more relevant programs. In Canada, the province of Ontario is moving to performance-based funding, where 60% of government funding, set 60% of government funding will depend on, on performance against 10 metrics, which are focused on jobs and skills and economic and community impact. They contribute to privatisation and marketization, not just of the sector overall by populating it with private providers, but also by um, uh, contributing to the privatisation and marketization of public um, institutions because they blur the divide between public and private for profit, um, particularly universities that are engaged with uh, third party vendors for online platforms. An example of this is FutureLearn, which is a big, um, uh, which is a big provider of micro credentials, which is owned by um, the Open University in the UK and Seek Limited. Seek Limited is a for-profit company listed on the stock exchange, um, which originally had its origins in public uh, university in Australia. And what happens is we see the unbundling of curriculum and outsourcing uh, of the. Um, of university provision through uh, micro-credentials, which are delivered for profit and which stack um, 
to, uh, towards a, a qualification in public university for domestic students. So as an illustration, for $969, it is possible to take an online micro-credential in customer experience management with Salesforce training, which includes training in a, in a company's proprietary software, and you can receive 15 credits towards an MA, MBA in global business um, at a university in London. I mean, gone are the days where one would expect a company to train new recruits in their own proprietary software. Recruits must now pay for this training themselves um, and come ready to work on day one. So I want to now move to discuss the tension between accreditation and just-in-time skills. There is a big tension between quick to market, relevant to market, micro-credentials, and credentialing and recognition of micro-credentials as part of a broader group of qualifications. The raison d'etre of micro-credentials is, is that they are quick to market. But governments want to recognise, count and credential all forms of learning wherever and whenever it happens as part of lifelong learning policies. And they don't want to have to pay unnecessarily um, for learning that they argue has already um, happened and been assessed. And they also argue it supports social inclusion by recognising learning that the most disadvantaged have done. And this is what the big push for recognition of prior learning was about for, uh, more than 20 years ago without a, a great deal of success. And this is what the um, European Union's common micro-credential framework is all about. So there's two dilemmas. The first is how to avoid, if you're going to credential everything and include it in your quality assurance frameworks, how to, how to avoid getting bogged down in quality assurance accreditation validation um, requirements. So if micro-credentials are to be included as credential certifications that count towards degrees and postgraduate programs, um, that if you're, going to, if you're going to have thousands of micro-credentials in a jurisdiction, is the jurisdiction going to do that themselves? Or are they going to ask universities internal quality, you know, uh, universities to implement their internal quality assurance processes to credential these certifications? Which is going to take a lot more time than people think, um, with the usual complaints about universities being slow to respond. And universities may also have a, a different view on what counts as um, valuable academic knowledge than the proponents of certification of job skills. I, I worked out that between Gavin and me, we've worked in about nine universities in two countries and our number of years experience, if you put it together, is about 75 years working in universities um, in roles that include being related to governance. And our experience of internal governance processes underpinning accreditation of programs and courses is that they are quite deliberate and take time and don't support a quick to market orientation. However, they do help to sustain the quality and integrity of the university's offerings. And the second dilemma is that whatever apps and platforms are used, they need to be underpinned by policies that make sense in jurisdictions. You know, they need to be able to make sense of what a qualifications framework is in that system and how all the bits um, fit together. And doing this in one country is hugely difficult, um, uh, very, very difficult. And it, it would be even, you know, of an order of magnitude more difficult um, to do it uh, internationally so that you have international recognition of these certifications. And so there is a dilemma, form over substance. So the form is that every, you know, that um, you have all these micro-credentials that are certified by these platforms and um, so on. Um, but what does that tell you about the quality of the program and the outcomes that um, students are able to achieve? And these issues are particularly acute in for-profit markets where there's a strong incentive to drive costs down. So what underpins this dilemma between quick to market, um, just in time skills and um, getting everything accredited um, so that it counts? Well, underpinning this we think um, is a family squabble between uh, orthodox human capital theory and it's very close cousin skills bias technological change theory. And in this section, we're drawing heavily on a book by Phil Brown, Hugh Lauder, which Hugh's going to be speaking to you about, and Sinyi uh, Chong, entitled The Death of Human Capital. So the current 
orthodoxy in education um, is underpinned by human capital, which posits that more education leads to more skills, which leads to higher productivity and from there to a more productive nation with higher gross domestic product. And the supply of educated labour elicits demand from the labour market and leads to higher wages as employers respond to high productivity um, of more highly educated individuals. And there's a direct linear connection between all these between education, skills, productivity, and GDP. It, and this applies at the level of the individual, at the group, at the industry sector and the economy. It's the same approach for everything. It also applies to equity. You know, the, I've heard many arguments um, uh, um, using human capital theory uh, to support, uh, to argue for equity, in which it's argued that um, participation in higher education matters because um, it, without including people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, we're not making full use of their human capital. Um, so the idea is that a person's position in society in the labour market is a result of their investment in education and it's fundamentally meritocratic. And this has been the orthodoxy for many, for 40 years or more, um, and it's summed up in the OECD's Education at a Glance, which is produced every year, in which the stock of human capital is measured through the stock of credentials um, in, the, in the country. But the problem is learning doesn't equal earning, and we've got the most educated population in the history of the planet, but we still have problems, putative problems of skills mismatches and underuse of qualifications. And this is because the outcomes in the labour market reflect social cleavages of class, race, gender, and other dimensions of disadvantage. Now, in skills bias technological change, the, the um, arrow of causation is, is reversed. So instead of education driving technological change, driving productivity, we have technological change eliciting um, more skills, more educated, um, uh, a more educated population that can, um, you know, that's technologically adept, um, leading to productivity and so on. And the argument of this of this theory is that the problem um, with using the the stock of credentials as your measure is that that's too blunt an instrument. That use of educational attainment is too blunt an instrument, and that there's massive variations in quality um, between nations and within nations. And therefore, we need to measure everything and everyone in the same way. And that's why we have PISA and TIMS and PIAC um, in uh, higher education, uh, in adult education. So the argument is that we need the right skills, and the World Economic Forum. Um, is a powerful advocacy body for capitalism and it has been promoting this notion of 21st century skills and in what it's done is it's expanded the scope of what counts as skill to go beyond foundational skill and competencies to now include character qualities and this is helping to drive um, the legitimation of micro credentials based on putative deficits of education um, in which individuals need to be provided with knowledge and skills they need in the labour market. It contributes to the suspicion of qualification. In here, there's a direct line between um, higher technologic, technological skills and also character qualities, such as empathy, um, where micro-credentials have been produced to meet demand for those skills. But Government want better and more effective skills assessment and recognition. And this is the fundamental tension with micro-credentials, how to capture all learning, but ensure quality recognition and accountability. And it's difficult to see how these tensions can be resolved in jurisdictions, governance and quality assurance frameworks and lifelong learning policies when the value, quality, credibility and authenticity of these credentials must be considered. I want now to move to the final section of our paper, which looks at micro-credentials as a response to precariousness in the labour market. So in a 2018 article, Means argues that platform learning harnesses the operating capabilities and logics of digital platforms such as Uber and Amazon to imagine synergies between on-demand labour and on-demand learning, transforming living into learning and learning into labour. For example, the OECD reports several large online platforms that facilitate the hiring of freelancers 
and they also offer online tests so that people can demonstrate they've got the right skills, even if that probably includes proprietary um, software. Seek Limited, which I referred to earlier, connects, say they connect job seekers with relevant nationally recognised courses. Um, so this is not far from the bull system where the foreman had discretion over who to choose to work for a day and to toss job tickets out to see who caught them. What this signifies, we think, is a, is a, a more fundamental tension or a bigger shift in the relation between education and work, which is a result of the increasing precarity of work um, and the on-demand economy of late capitalism, which is often digitally mediated, but reflects broader, um, the broader evolution of social relationships and power. So technology plays an important role, um, but it's the, the social relationships and relations of power in which technology operates that has resulted in the outcomes that we see. And this, this is basically the triumph of Finance, financial capitalism and the decline of the welfare state where individuals have to invest in their own human capital development as their safety net against risk. I'll go into that a little bit more later. Here we argue precarious work includes subcontracting, casual work and temporary work, but that it, it, it's more pervasive than that. Bourdieu argues that um, what we have is inst institutionalised precarity and that this is the doxa of late capitalism. He says, thus has come into being an economic regime that is inseparable from a political regime, a mode of production that entails a mode of domination based on the institution of insecurity, domination through precariousness, a deregulated financial market fosters a deregulated labour market and therefore the casualization of labor that cows workers into submission. So this affects everyone, not just those who are in gig jobs. So in Australia, the, in universities, everyone knows what a spill and fill is um, and everyone fears the spill and fill. So it, and it's, it's casual cruelty in which people's lives are treated. So it's a regular occurrence. So Australian universities spill all the positions in a department, in a faculty, in, in, in a division, and then they'll fill. People have to apply for their jobs, um, for, the, for the jobs that they had before. It's just that there's not as many jobs and they're often at lower pay. Um, there's nothing personal about this, but in my view, this is the, the, there is casual cruelty that, that underpins this system. So the notion is that all of us have to invest in our human capital and take on greater risk in the labour market, where we have to second guess the requirements of the labour market, where we have to hit the ground running, and that education is now the, the, the safety net, and that individuals have to make sound investments, and if they don't, or if the investments don't work out, it's because of the decisions that they have made. But actually what we see is systematic disinvestment by employers um, into in, um, in, in to training their own workforce. So here what we have is from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and it shows you the percentages of um, people who respond to the question, you know, have you done any non-formal learning? So non-formal learning might be a course that's organised or it might be structured um, uh, uh, learning activities, just not credentialed. So have you done any formal learning, non-formal learning, work-related training, personal interest learning, and so on? Now, formal learning has gone up a bit, and we know that. Um, but what is interesting is that non-formal learning and work-related learning have both declined dramatically over a period of about 10 years. And if you go back even further, the decline um, is even, even greater. So employers are, are now expecting people just to come on day one with the skills or to do them um, themselves if they if they haven't already got them. So in another paper that we uh, is being published soon, what we argue is that this whole approach atomizes and fragments knowledge and skills as well as jobs. Um, so micro credentials are small, they can be taken in any order or in any combination or standalone and it undermines any notion of coherence of hierarchy, of cumulative hierarchical coherence, basically. Um, and it, and it, it severs the relationship between systems of meaning within um, 
the academic disciplines, but also within the applied fields of knowledge. The problem, as Brown, Lauder and Chiang argue, is that we have a job scarcity, not a labour scarcity. They say the fundamental problem is not that there is a shortage of the relevant skills that employers demand, but that there is a lack of good quality jobs. Um, the problem that needs to be addressed is not labour scarcity, but job scarcity. And in a congested labour market and expanding higher education, qualifications are a necessary defensive tool um, rather than a differentiating, differentiating factor for the majority of jobs. And, but individuals must differentiate themselves further over and above the qualification that they have. Um, and micro-credentials are one way they can do this. This is Siri thinking that I'm talking to it for some reason. Go away, Siri. Um, and this is not the realisation of the self presented um, by progressive discourses which promise social inclusion, access, diversity and democratisation. Rather, it's the way in which individuals participate in and compete with each other in the hungry mile. So how, how far have we come? Inequality within nations is at similar levels as it was to just before the Great Depression um, 90 years ago. There's been some improvement between nations, but, but inequality between nations is still stark and manifestly unjust. So our conclusion is that micro-credentials are gig credentials for the gig economy, that they're not a tool for democracy or social inclusion, despite the fact that they are legitimated through that language. They contribute to the privatisation of education by unbundling curriculum. Um, which uh, public institutions then have delivered by third party um, private vendors. And there is a tension between fast to market and accreditation. They discipline the higher education curriculum and fragment um, knowledge and skills. And um, in, in contrast, we argue that what's needed is access to a meaningful qualification that has value in society and the labour market. And this is a broader vision of um, education, that education should help people to live lives that they have reason to value. In contrast, micro-credentials send people scurrying about like the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland, but this disguises job scarcity and social congestion in the labour market. And it individualises the outcome of an unequal labour market in late capitalism, which is um, which is characterised by precarity. So the last stanza um, of The Hungry Mile says, and when the world grows wiser and all men are at last are free, when none shall feel the hunger nor tramp in misery, to beg the right to slave for bread, the children there may smile at, the, at those strange tales they tell of what was once the Hungry Mile. So we've got some way to go. Um, and this is a demonstration in 2017 um, in Colombo, Sri Lanka, where um, unions um, from many unions from around the world came to Sri Lanka to demonstrate against precarious work. So thank you for that. And what we've got here is we've got if people are more if people are interested in the hungry mile, we've got quite a lot of um, references here. It's a big part of um, Australian culture um, to understand and part of you know folk music. Um, which tells the story of the Hungry Mile. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. We really, um, as Lisa said, um, working, uh, Lisa has had a very long history of working with us at the Real Centre. Um, and so we were really happy that she could have kicked off our seminar series today with an incredibly interesting, provocative and powerful presentation. And thanks also to Gavin, um, the other author of the paper. Uh, my name is Stephanie Alles. Um, I'm the research chair of skills development at the Real Center. And I'm going to be um, hosting the Q&A and discussion session. I've got a couple of questions in the chat and in the Q&A, um, but people can also raise their hands and um, we can give people um, the ability to speak in the seminar. It's obviously this um, seminar software, so att attendees don't automatically have the right to speak, unfortunately, in this digital world, but we can um, give you the right to speak. But I'll start, Lisa, by just giving you a couple of the questions that have come in the comments and the Q&A, um, and then we'll see if, if people want to speak directly or if they just want to type 
their questions in. So we've, we've got a couple of questions that are um, much more aimed at um, how, how is it working? So th there's a question in the Q&A about which qualifications frameworks have successfully incorporated um, micro-credentials um, and how has this worked? And there's uh, also, there were, there were a few comments, um, one from Paul Kamein from the ILO, who we're very pleased to have joining us today, and, uh, and a response from Gavin um, on micro-credentials in, um, have not been incorporated in Ontario, and Paul said that they were incorporated in New Zealand. Um, so maybe if you could just reflect a little bit on, on that set of issues. Um, yeah, so I think that the, the, the impetus from the, the, the person who first asked the question was, are there examples of successful incorporations? And I think that your paper and where you talk about the tension between, um, you know, just on time learning and accredited quality learning um, already begins to, to point to the difficulties of that. So that's a, it's a sort of a, like a how to question. And we've got two similar ones. Um, one on other examples of employers recognizing micro credentials and are they offering path, formal pathways to formal work? And another one asking, are they offering pathways to entrepreneurship opportunities, which many people um, argue is the solution to unemployment in South Africa? So, so those are kind of questions aimed at how is it working? And then on a very, very different kind of um, in a very different direction, we've got a question asking, um, how can education contribute to fundamental freedoms that foster learning that leads to unlimited choices after graduation? So this is from someone um, at a TVET college who teaches mm -hmm. in a TVET college, Simpiwe in South Africa, who is arguing that um, students need self-reliance skills but also he's, he's arguing that it's a, there's a legitimate entitlement for education to, to offer people choices after mm. graduation. Mm. So, yeah, so I thought you could start by um, responding to some of those and then um, we'll see who, who wants to um, ask a question. So the hands that worked, um, so, so like um, MOOCs, the, what we've got is the promise rather than the realization of, of micro credentials. Uh, it, it's a similar thing that happened with MOOCs that we were argued that it was going to lead to democratize, you know, democratization, democratic access to higher levels of education all over the world. How has it worked? Well, in, in New Zealand, New Zealand is the first jurisdiction that I know of that's incorporated micro credentials into um, its uh, qualifications framework. And it hasn't been going for that long. Um, so it would be interesting to talk to someone about what's happened there. I did attend a seminar on uh, micro-credentials that was run in New Zealand as, uh, uh, towards the end of last year, and they are still in the process of doing it, and they promise quick turnaround of accreditation. Um, so they might be able to do that to begin with. It would be, as I said, interesting to talk to them about, about how um, that's going. Um, but New Zealand it is a small jurisdiction. It's got 4 million people. You know, it, when you're talking about, and, and a lot of these reforms are always easier to do in small jurisdictions where there's high levels of trust, where people know each other and you can get everyone who really is involved in education in, into the one boardroom um, to talk about these sorts of issues. Well, Australia has implemented, uh, rushed through uh, at, the, um, at the beginning of COVID, rushed through um, the incorporation of a new credential on the Australian Qualifications Framework called the Higher Education Certificate, which was six months long. And um, that has got provisional inclusion on the AQF until the end of this year. Um, but the, the minister has said that it's going to stay. And the latest review of the AQF has been about incorporating um, uh, incorporating micro credentials on the qualifications framework. So, so how's it working in Australia? I'm not exactly sure. The only thing that I can say is that they must be relying on universities' internal um, internal quality assurance processes to get these things up, um, and that these internal quality assurance processes. Um, 
may or may not um, be more or less uh, focused depending on whether the qualification can stack towards a bigger qualification. So I don't know how they're doing it. The only way that I can think of jurisdictions doing this in in, in big jurisdictions, this, you know, like this is practical wonk, policy wonk stuff we're talking about here. The only way I can think about it being done in big jurisdictions um, is if they rely on universities' internal quality assurance to get it done, if they want it credentialed, if they want it to count. Um, I can't see how else they can do it and that that isn't necessarily going to be an easy process for the reasons that that I outlined. Um, that if I, I can't see academic boards just rolling over and saying, "Okay, you know, let's just um, rush these things through," so we'll, we'll have to see um, how how it's happening. Do employers recognise micro credentials? Well, they may or may not. You know, like there's a whole lot of different Microsoft certifications, different proprietary software, like particularly in logistics. Um, which universities incorporate into their um, into their programs, which may or may not be um, recognised by employers. But my point is that employers should be paying for that. That the point of education is not to train um, individuals on how to do uh, you know, how to implement proprietary software. Education in universities and in TVET um, should be preparing people for occupations more broadly and to live their lives. Um, and so that kind of training, which what which used to be what employers did internally, has is now being increasingly um, outsourced. Does it lead to pathways to formal work? It depends. Um, if you have already got a credential, um, if you have already got uh, a degree or something like that, it may well be the icing on the cake that helps you differentiate yourself. But as, as Hugh and the others have pointed out, that's, that's, a, that's not gonna necessarily happen because the problem is that there isn't enough good jobs, um, not that people don't have the right skills. So does it work there? Perhaps, perhaps not. What about people who don't have credentials? And this is for whom the issue really matters most of all. And, and this is what jurisdictions like New Zealand haven't yet quite worked out. And this is what I hear in discussion um, in, in policy circles, is what about people who don't have anything? Is it the way out of um, having no credentials um, and into the labour market? And the evidence says it's not. The evidence says um, in Australia in vocational education, where we've had skill sets for a very long time, skill sets are chunks of qualifications organised around particular role within a job, um, all the, uh, the, the, the labour market outcomes are much better for those people who have got full qualifications rather than for those who've got part qualifications, if they've got no other qualification. And there's been research in the US recently, um, which New America, uh, which is a, a, a think tank, um, reported on, which again shows that even though students are very enthusiastic um, about doing this, that they have hopes and aspirations for what these may re uh, lead to, that the actual labour market outcomes are pretty crappy. Um, and so this is not a way to support um, the most disadvantaged into, um, into uh, further education. Before I worked in universities, I used to work in the adult community ed sector. I used to run a community centre neighbourhood house type thing in Australia. And that was the way to get people into formal learning um, by having them be able to access informal learning. So the idea was that when people came to um, participate in Neighbourhood House, and there's a big thing called Men's Sheds in Australia, um, which is for men who are older men, working class men uh, who are retired, uh, where they can just go and hang out and, and do stuff together, courses together. It's that sort of learning where you're not, uh, where people have, where people learn to be successful learners, where you're not um, stamping um, the word illiterate on their forehead as they walk in the door as a condition to being able to access funded learning. It's the, it's the broad, uncredentialed, community-based informal learning um, that is the stepping stone for people back into learning based on exp having, ex having a good experience of what learning can be rather than being labelled as a deficit. So I don't think this is a strategy that's going to help people who are disadvantaged. Uh, and the, Thanks, um, oh. yeah, sorry. No, I was no, just gonna, carry on. 
the entrepreneurship thing. Yes, there's many MOOCs on entrepreneurship as far as I know. Um, but for, and and I, I I don't for a minute think that I can get involved in debates in South Africa about the role of entrepreneurship in solving your graduate unemployment rate, which is staggering. Um, but certainly my understanding of entrepreneurship when it's undertaken by people who are from the most disadvantaged backgrounds is that it's a sign of an unequal and weak labour market and weak unions, um, which a labour market which doesn't have many opportunities and entrepreneurship hasn't solved that problem in those places that I know about, but I leave the South African colleagues to take that debate up. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I've got a couple of more questions in the chat. Oh, sorry, were you still busy? Yeah, the TVET College, the question from the TVET oh, College. I, yeah. I absolutely agree with, with that uh, colleague um, who, who raises that point. Um, there's been some very nice work done in the European Union on the capabilities approach, particularly on working with the most dis disenfranchised young people. And their point is that um, access to education or, or active labour market policies, which are predicated on there being no choice, on being you have to do whatever it is, you have to take whatever crappy job that's offered. Um, and in Australia, the, 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 the model of that was um, people having to become security guards um, because it got people off the unemployment books but back into the unemployment queue, you know, six months later, that, that their work in the EU is arguing that young people have to have real choice um, and that education needs to facilitate that. And I think the way we do that is by helping people to become citizens of their occupations, um, you know, so that they can, so, so they can exercise voice and agency within their occupations rather than just by focusing on teaching them how to be compliant workers for jobs that they don't want and hate. Okay. So on, on that note, Lisa, I've got a question about occupations for you. This is from um, Yael Shalem, a colleague at The Real Centre. And she says, thank you for a great talk. I totally agree with your argument. There is a claim that occupation will become obsolete. And this is why just-in-time training and micro-credentials will help the transition from education to work and from one workplace to another. What is your response to this claim? I'm gonna give you a couple more questions, Lisa. Sorry, if you don't mind. Do you mind? Do you wanna rather do them one by one? No, that's, you know, no, a couple more. Okay. Um, Rudo, you had your hand up. Do you still want to ask a question? I've unmuted you so that you can ask it. Uh, will you let me know if you still want to ask it? Rudo Mazinier, um, who is uh, a PhD student at the Real Center and a, also a college lecturer. So let me know if you still want to talk, Rudo. Then I've got a comment from um, Fulke Wiedekind, who says, thanks, Lisa and Gavin. I really like a historical link back to the dock workers. That system remains very much in place in South Africa and elsewhere in construction, et cetera. It's good to make the connection with the supposedly more skilled occupations in the gig economy. So that's a comment. Then we've got a comment from um, Simon McGrath. Great to have you here, Simon. Another um, great uh, colleague and friend of the Real Center. Simon says, Lisa, while I agree overall, I think the Microsoft example isn't a good one. There's mm. lots of evidence that Microsoft, San Cisco, et cetera, um, their accreditation is very highly valued by other employers and as a badge for small enterprise computer technicians. Um, sort of segueing from that, there's a couple of comments and questions about um, edX, Coursera, um, one person asked, is it wasn't the idea behind the edX Coursera model of, of making qualifications more cost effective by being able to do bits at a time? And another person said, isn't this actually making education more expensive because you have to pay for each of the little bits separately? Um, and the suggestion was that this might be happening um, in, in Canada, in Ontario. Um, and then there's another comment about uh, corporates that are creating universities by investing, uh, investing in social corporate social responsibility programs in India, platforms such as edX Coursera, tying up with the top universities and legitimizing the credentials process, um, including ma micro master's degrees programs by MIT. So that's a, a, a range of different kinds of questions and comments, Lisa. You might not be able to respond to all of them, but. Uh, Let's just hear some, some comments and responses from you. Sure. Um, on, on the question of occupations becoming obsolete, um, I think 
no, I don't. Yes and no. You know, uh, I think that we've got. We, we, it, it's important to understand that um, labour markets are differentiated, and that within differentiated labour markets, we've got regulated occupations which are not becoming obsolete, um, even though there's often pressure to deregulate them. Um, you know, such as in the health fields, these are usually occupations for where there are public health and safety consequences if, if something goes wrong and they're regulated by government, often um, relegated, re relegating that authority to professional um, bodies. Um, but so there's that. And then we have big, um, you know, big companies where there's internal labour markets, like in the big accounting firms where people come in at a certain level and then they climb the ladder internally. Uh, and there's often inter internal ladders for them to do that, including in internal training. But usually that's actually available for people who come in with a degree. It's not as often for people who come in with below degree qualifications. Then we, so we call, that, that, that's the internal labour market. And then um, during our work um, done by Serena Yu and um, John McCann at the University of Sydney, um, we've got external labour markets where um, there's no occupational ladder where people have to second guess the labour market, second guess what the requirements are going to be in the labour market. And that's most of the labour market, you know. So they might work in fields, um, but they don't necessarily work in fields where there's clear ladders or, or lines best uh, or lines. So what we found when, well, what Serena and John found when they, when they um, looked at that is that the areas where there's a lot of churn in the labour market are in the low skilled occupations. So um, there's huge amounts of churn between different industries and different fields in low skilled occupations. But there's enormous stability in the rest of the labour market. In fact, the instability in the rest of the labour market is often um, over over emphasised. And certainly in occupations requiring university credentials, the, the, the churn isn't as great as what you would expect. So generally speaking, you're not going to get someone who works in engineering wanting to work in early childhood, not as a general rule, right? I mean, they, um, or someone who works in early childhood is not going to want to usually take up an engineering degree. They might want to work in a related field like social work or something like that. So the, in the work that we did in Australia with um, uh, Gavin and I and John and others uh, was to look at the notion of vocational streams that rather than... Um, trying to train people for a specific narrowly defined occupations that we should instead be trying to support people to um, um, practice in a vocational stream which which consists of linked occupations um, that share uh, similar underpinning knowledge and skills so for example in care work um, rather than mental health care aged care disability care um, and so on that we would have an, a broad occupation called care work um, that would have different ladders so so we think that would result in better links between um, occupations and education. But the biggest problem is that if governments insist in the liberal market economies of having deregulated labour markets, then making those connections tighter between work and the, and the labour market is always going to be difficult. If government wants to have um, better connections between education and the labour market, then they need to regulate the labour market, not education. Um, and all the societies where there's tight connections between education and the labour market are in those countries like Germany, where there are strong, strongly regulated labour markets. So in Germany, there's more than 300 regulated occupations for which you have to do an apprenticeship. You can't become a bank clerk unless you've done the right apprenticeship. Um, and so if, if government wants tighter connections, that's what it's going to um, need to do. Okay, now on to the next one, Microsoft. Probably, uh, Simon, you're probably right, that probably wasn't the best example. It was, um, it is an example of a highly um, valued um, certification. And another example would be, say, for example, people doing apprenticeships at Rolls-Royce or something like that. So you do have examples of things um, like that, um, Microsoft, SAP, um, which are highly valued, but that doesn't necessarily negate the whole argument um, about these being pathways into um, uh, jobs. We, we have in Ontario tons of colleges that consist of boot camps for coding. Um, the idea that everyone needs to be able to code and if you know how to code, you're going to get a good job it hasn't actually solved the problem um, as far as, you know, as far as I can tell. We still have enormous... Um, 
you know, people, you know, they're still churning people out. We still have putative skills mismatches and so on. Um, so making educational, oh, is it making education more more cost effective or um, or is it is it making it more expensive? Well, probably doing a bit of both, depending on the jurisdiction and depending on how government wants to drive change. So in Ontario at the moment, the government is making available funding to people who are doing uh, government support to people who are doing micro-credentials on exactly the same basis um, as people doing degrees and diplomas. And that's because it's wanting to drive change. It's wanting to embed and institutionalise change uh, in the policy framework. But in the longer run, basically what this is about is about individuals paying, um, cost shifting to individuals. You know, we saw that table I showed you um, about how employers are disinvesting in their own internal professional development. The fundamental idea in the long run is that individuals will pay more, even if they do it in, in different chunks. What we need instead, rather than arguing against the piecemeal character of this or, or arguing about you know, if we tweak this or if we do that or if we make a tiny change somewhere, we need to be arguing for educational policies that provide access and support for people to access meaningful education and to receive the support that they need in order to be able to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. I've got some more comments. Um, and questions. It's uh, clearly really stimulating a lot of debate and discussion. Um, and I don't know if, if any of the attendees want to actually speak. P Paul Kamein from the ILO um, made an interesting comment. He said, thanks very much for the presentation, but it seems to me that the wide definition of micro-credentials you use conflates the positive and negative characteristics of partial qualifications. If a mm -hmm. micro-credential is a short course aligned with industry needs and substantive enough to count towards a qualification, then, that, then by definition, a module leading to a statement of attainment is viewed through the same lens as a 20-minute online learning program. I think this is problematic. Paul, I don't know if you want to, um, if you want to add to that, I can, um, I can um, give you speaking ability in the meeting, but thanks for the mm -hmm. comment. And then we've got an, a, a, an interesting question from Hugh Lauder. Mm -hmm. uh, which follows up in a way on the question that Yael asked. So I think you've kind of addressed it, but um, you might want to, um, I'm just raising it anyway, you might want to say more. Hugh says, hi, Lisa. In light of the discussion that occupations will be replaced by tasks and hence micro-credentials, do you think that we're looking at a restructuring of work with a high-level set of managers or super managers, even worse, determining the nature and allocation of tasks? Um, then we have um, a comment from um, Sally Vinden from Vancouver Island, who says, thanks for this thought-provoking presentation. I want to share my current experience of micro-credentials in the context of um, Canada. I'm currently tasked with developing a micro-credential for a building service worker. The full program is 240 hours and includes a work-based practicum. The micro-credential is said to be 24 hours how can they be equal? Yet the credential will be the same. I can yeah. see this initiative depriving those with least access from meaningful educational opportunities. And then finally, in the chat, um, we have uh, Judy Harris, um, moonlighting as Jean Gamble, who's given us a very uh, useful reference to a paper on the recognition of non-formal education. So please, everyone, do look up um, the reference. Um, I'm just drawing your attention to it. It looks at MOOCs and open uh, and OECs as well as work in India and elsewhere in the world. Oh, uh, sorry, open educational resources, OERs. Um, so yeah, so that's just a, just to draw everyone's attention to that um, useful paper. Um, and over back to you, Lisa. So that that last colleague, that last comment from the colleague from Vancouver Island is related to Paul Commons' comment, which I think is a good point. Actually, yes, that is one of the problems. Um, that um, that all of these things are put on the same level. You know, like I've always been in favour of um, of certificate four in Australia leading to a diploma, leading to a, um, a degree. I've always been in favour of um, ladders between occupations um, as a social safety net for those who um, who you know to support them to progress. Um, I've worked on pathways all my life. In, in fact, since 
since the early 1990s where that, that's been a key principle. I think that what micro, so yes, I agree that conflating micro credentials with say a, um, a, a, a chunk of something that's substantive enough um, that you can put on an academic transcript is a, um, is, is a huge problem, but, but, the, but it goes, it's deeper than that. I mean, the, the problem is that I, um, if you go online and you look on YouTube and stuff about how to develop micro-credentials, um, you see that they're all based on this notion of um, methodological individualism, you know, that, the, that the, you can build from tiny incremental bits up to the top. Um, and so they have a, a micro credential, say, of six months, but it's made up of all these micro certifications of this and that. Um, and it's that that breaks the coherence of qualifications. And qualifications should have coherence. They should represent something meaningful, not just the addition of um, uh, lots of bits and pieces that are added up to make a whole. Um, and I think pathways... Pathways, good pathways, um, which are based on uh, curricular coherence between uh, between different levels of qualifications, um, is a completely different issue to this. You know, to this to this atomization into micro certifications um, and and then building up from um, from there. But I also agree that conflating them with with stuff that can go on a testimony um, is is a big issue. Um, and so that also relates to the, you know, the, the colleague from the colleague, that comment from the colleague from Vancouver Island. How can these things be the same? Well, they can't. Um, and the problem for things like the building trades, in fact, we just had a, um, a PhD student finish um, at Carlton, uh, University of Carlton in, in Ontario, who's now in Vancouver Island, um, who did a PhD on the building trades in, um, in British Columbia between the late nine uh, between the uh, over a 12 year period and and this was a period in when uh qualifications were deregulated for the um building trades and what that led to was the de-skilling of the entire industry um well the de-skilling of the industry um and so you you had certifications emerging for different parts like you know just for argument's sake door framer you know stair builder um, rather than carpenter, and in the end, they had to get rid of it because it, it, of the um, of the deleterious effects that it had um, on that on the skill level in that industry. Which relates to um, Hugh's point: Are we seeing are we seeing the restructuring of work? Perhaps we're seeing the restructuring of work in the the the. In, in more in unskilled occupations, right? So we all know. So we know that um, the the we in many countries now we have an hourglass shaped labour market. You know, so a big group of you know big um, uh, unskilled workforce, medium skilled workforce, uh, or intermediate skills that had jobs. That's where jobs have gone. Um, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, and then we still have quite a big um, professional um, uh, workforce, and so it's this hourglass labour market. The fact that there are not occupational ladders, um, there are not opportunities to start a job and to build your way up. Um, that I think that's what we've seen. That we've seen that as a fundamental restructuring of the labour market. I think Hugh probably goes a bit further than me in. Um, arguing about that and but so I'll be interested to hear Hugh's presentation on that. Thanks Lisa. I've got um, two interesting questions but before I uh, before I'll just make a very brief comment in response to you and Hugh um, which is to say that usually education lags behind work so I think that Hugh's point is an interesting one in the sense that it does suggest that what we're seeing in education is a kind of a belated response to um, a, ch a changing labor market. Now, my colleague Joy Papier from the University of the Western Cape has a different take. And I think it's actually a really interesting point that she's raising. She says, thanks so much for an interesting presentation, Lisa and Gavin. Would it be fair to say that micro-credentialing for those who embark on it is more about access to a very closed education and training sector rather than employment per se as an end in itself, possibly because access to coherent qualifications is so limited. Um, 
And then we have um, a question from Glynis Vergatini, who is a, a PhD student and researcher at the Real Center. Um, and she asks, to what extent are universities embracing breaking up certification into bits? It seems that it is viewed as a definite income stream from corporates mm -hmm. and a steady stream of students. How is this affecting knowledge as the content seems to be prescribed by the corporates? And I know that um, Lisa mentioned another forthcoming paper, which looks at that aspect of micro-credentialing um, from the knowledge perspective. Lisa, I don't know if you want to, or Gavin, maybe in the chat, um, you could put up the details of that um, forthcoming paper. Um, because I think it, that that paper, in fact, addresses Glennis's question more directly, but you might want to respond to either of those. Yes, sure. Um, it's the, the paper is going to be published in the Journal of Curriculum Studies in a special edition, which is being um, edited by uh, Joe Muller um, from the University of Cape Town, Jim Horden from Bath and uh, Zingy Dong from um, uh, History of Education in London. And I'm not sure when it's coming out soon, right? Um, and so Gavin and I got a piece on that and it's, it's a Bernstinian analysis um, of the impact of micro-credentials on knowledge and skills. And we argue that basically what, what they do is that they, 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 they transform the principle of recontextualization for selecting knowledge from the field in which it's produced and reproducing it in curriculum from, they, they transform the principle of recontextualization to the specific requirements of jobs job tasks and roles instead of um, a relational system of meaning in which um, uh, knowledge is embedded. So we developed that argument um, in, some, in some point. Now, Joy's, Joy's um, question is really important. And that's what I was trying to get at before. What are we gonna do about people who don't have access to education? Aren't micro-credentials the way in? Well, if they were, I'd support it, but, but that's not what the evidence has, has been. There's the, this report by New America, um, showed that uh, people think it's going to get them jobs and, and that's why they're doing it. I mean, and everyone who goes to college or university hopes they're going to get a job, but, but just because that's what they want doesn't mean that education has to be only about everything that's related to that, um, to, to that job. So what do we do about people who don't have access? Um, I think we, th this is not the way they're going to get access, basically. Um, I, that they are seeking access to have access to education in order to build to something in order to get a job. Absolutely. Um, what we need to be fighting for is instead of investing vast amounts of money um, in micro-credentials and in incorporating these in jurisdictional quality assurance frameworks and qual qual uh, qualifications frameworks, we should be arguing for um, broad-based learning opportunities in the community that are and that support people to access education. Um, if micro-credentials worked to do this, I would be in favour of it. If micro I mean, I mean, one of the key things that they might do is they might give people, um, you know, confidence that they can do something, but certainly that's what adult and community education has always done. I mean, this is basically the turf of adult and community education. And I don't think credentialing all forms of learning in that sector um, are going to help. I remember in the 1980s when I was running this community arts centre, um, community centre, we used to run dressmaking courses um, and craft classes, and they were often the first step into formal education for people who were, for women who couldn't read. Um, and, they, and they would come along and say, I forgot my glasses, can you read it for me? You know, and eventually when they learned to trust us, um, they would um, uh, tell us that they couldn't read and we'd help them access the literacy class or we'd help them access classes at the local TAFE, um, the, 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 the local college. But anyway, to get back to this story. So we used to run these courses um, on dressmaking and so on. And we used to have a lot of enrollments. And then the only way to get them funded was if they um, consisted of um, units of, uh, if they were part of the certificate two in dressmaking based on units of competency that lead to this and that. That then began to turn us into all sorts of twists and turns in a way, you know, that distorted the actual point of what we were trying to do in that adult and community education setting. Um, so I think the thing that we need to do is to invest in institutions, in education, like adult and community education centres, like FET colleges, like universities, 
um, and invest in those institutions to support their communities to access education rather than thinking that a credentialing route is the way that we're going to go. So it's the big problem. What do we do? You know, what do we do? Yeah. Yeah, that is the big problem. And um, maybe that's a good note to start wrapping it up because I think in a way our next seminar uh, with you, Lauda, does start giving um, a way forward. And uh, without putting words in Hugh's mouth, um, he uh, starts looking at the problem of labor demand as opposed to uh, skill demand as the key problem. And that that's the problem that we need to be addressing. And also implies that we need to start maybe um, not seeing such a, not seeing the necessity for this kind of immediate tight link between education and work, seeing it as a, a less tightly um, based relationship. So I think that that's, um, that's an interesting kind of direction. And I think that um, we're really hoping in the seminar series um, over the course of the year, and we just put up a few of our um, upcoming seminars, but we have others planned for the rest of the year. Um, and we're really hoping to start unpacking these issues. How can education better prepare people for work, to do work well, to do good work? But what, but how can it, what, what are the limits to what education can do? Where should we stop looking to education to solve social problems? So I think that um, Lisa's given us a fantastic kickoff to our seminar series. Just a reminder to everyone, we will send out the invitation to everyone who's here and please share it widely to our next seminar, which is on the 14th of April with Hugh Lauder, uh, the death of human capital theory, question um, mark. So I think that that promises to also be a very uh, provocative and interesting talk. So I'd really welcome you all to join us again. And I just really want to give a very, very big thank you to Lisa and Gavin, who has been very actively responding and giving very interesting comments in the chats. Um, and to Lisa for her really energetic and dynamic and engaging presentation on these, um, on these uh, very topical and complex um, and difficult issues. So thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, everyone for joining us here today. I think it's been a, a really great event and really, really interesting and thought provoking. And you can see Lisa, it's, it's sparked off questions coming from so many different angles and raised so many different issues for, for all of us thinking about the relationships between education and work. Um, Prisha, do you want to come in and, and round things up or shall we just um, end it at that? Any last comments from you, Lisa? No, thank you. It's been a pleasure to work with you to do this, as it always is, Steph, and to work with your Sandra. I think that the um, I'm going to be suggesting to um, our thesis group that they might be interested in participating in that seminar series. It looks just fantastic. So thank you for this opportunity. Wonderful. We'd, we'd really love to have them. And maybe we can start building stronger relationship between the two centres. So awesome as ever, Lisa. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. And looking forward to seeing all of you on the 14th of April.